Natural disasters like hurricanes, earthquakes, and floods are unavoidable, but deaths from them can be prevented. One way is through constructing more resilient buildings. I talked with Elizabeth Hausler. She's a global expert on resilient building and post-disaster reconstruction. She's also the founder and CEO of Build Change, an international nonprofit organization that builds earthquake-resistant homes around the globe. I traveled to the Aspen Ideas Festival in Colorado to talk with Elizabeth about her childhood and what inspired her desire to build. I grew up in a small town outside of Chicago. My dad owned a, a small business doing masonry construction. And so during the summer in high school and college, I worked for my dad as a bricklayer alongside my sister as well. Really? And, and uh, was it one of those things where you got to come help dad or was it something you really wanted to do? Oh, I wanted to do. It was great. It was great. I mean, you could get outside, you could produce something and by the end of the day, you could actually see what you'd done. You'd built part of someone's house or part of a building. And it was fun. My dad, you know, my dad was, was both a serious and a joker at the same time. You know, he's very serious about doing good quality work and, and making sure the client was happy. But, you know, he would just occasionally throw out these one-liners, construction site one-liners, um, that were just hilarious. Just in the middle of the day, afternoon, construction site gets quite, kind of quiet, and he would just shout out how time flies when you love your work. It was a great job. So yeah. talk to me about that transition, and, and how did you get on this road, so to speak? Yeah, similar but different. Neither of my parents went to college, and my dad encouraged both my sister and I to study engineering, and that's what we both did. And, but there was no one to really carry on the family business of building houses. And I feel like I've done that in some small way because I'm still working on housing, although it is in a completely different context. So we work in Asia and Latin America, working with folks to build and design and provide access to financing for housing so that it does not collapse in the next earthquake or typhoon. So I, I think I've carried on my dad's legacy, but with a twist. Elizabeth studied engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and earned her master's degree in environmental science at the University of Colorado Boulder. Her organization, Build Change, is aimed at reducing deaths and injuries from buildings that collapse during earthquakes or typhoons in developing countries. Take us to the beginning phase of this. Uh, what was that like? Because people's lives, uh, I've, you know, I've lived through earthquakes. Uh, it's, it's devastating to your psyche, yeah. but when your homes are devastated, uh, that's, that's your livelihood, that's your life. Uh, so what was it like? After every event that we respond to, I mean, it's equally devastating and heartbreaking to see people who have lost their home, they've lost their livelihood, they've lost their opportunity. Some, a lot of homeowners we work with uh, run small businesses out of their homes, so they've lost the ability to get back to work. They may have lost a family member. I mean, uh, disasters expose people, especially women and girls, to terrible things, violence and trafficking. And it's every time it happens, it's terrible to see. But every time it happens, we know that we could have prevented this from happening. We know it is possible to design and build safe buildings that don't collapse and kill people, don't create homelessness. And so on the one hand, it's devastating, but on the other hand, it's very, it, 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 it's it's motivating because it is possible to fix the situation. It's possible to build a safe house. It's possible to create an environment where people can get back to work and get their lives back on track. It's one thing to have an idea. It, the execution piece of it is, is another element of that. Uh, so you come up with the idea and then what happens? So I came up the, with the idea in India after the 2001 earthquake in Gujarat that killed about 20,000 people. I went there on a Fulbright Fellowship to just study and understand how are people rebuilding after this disaster? Are they doing it in a way where people are, are satisfied? Um, is the process sustainable? Are the houses resilient? And so we came up back then with the three S's, safety, satisfaction, and sustainability as our goal. Safety, of course, we want the building to be disaster resilient. Uh, satisfaction, the homeowner has to, um, has to like the home and feel happy and safe there. And what we saw in, in past earthquake uh, reconstructions around the world was that if, if someone from some foreigner or local comes in with the idea of where the toilet should go, they put the toilet inside, the homeowner wants it outside, and it just it doesn't work. I mean, we have to respect people's um, 
preferences on architecture and materials. So satisfaction is the second S. And sustainability for us back then meant that people continue to build safe houses in the future. So it was that sort of study period um, after the Gujarat earthquake where we came up with the three S's, safety, satisfaction, and sustainability. And we came up with the model that we would use, which is a homeowner driven model. So in this model, instead of coming in and giving someone a house, instead, uh, we provide conditional cash plus technical assistance. So in, 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 instead, of, instead of treating the homeowner like a beneficiary, we are putting them in, the, in a decision-making position. So they decide the materials, they decide the architecture, they decide where is their door, they decide where is their toilet, and they don't build the house. We're not talking about sweat equity. They hire a local builder who we have trained or we train on the job, they purchase the building materials, they handle the cash, but it's done in a conditional way. So the cash is given out in installments. If you don't follow the building standard, then you don't get the next installment. And we've seen this model, which was originally used in India after the 2001 Gujarat earthquake, we've seen this model take hold in the post-disaster housing reconstruction uh, space because Organizations have realized that just giving someone a house ha has so many problems and so many challenges. It's better to put the homeowner in the decision-making position, enable them to decide how to build their house and, and, and build their confidence that it will keep their family safe in an earthquake. In 2008, a magnitude 8.0 earthquake struck South Central China, killing nearly 70,000 people. Build Change quickly deployed to Wenchuan County in Sichuan province to help in the reconstruction. So we worked in China after the 2008 Wenchuan earthquake in a rural area called Tumen Township with homeowners there to rebuild houses that had collapsed. And it was an incredibly rewarding and successful program because, you know, there are a lot of, there are these three obstacles to building safely. One is money, one is technology, and the other is people or political will. And in that program, all of those elements were there. We had, there was adequate financing provided by the Chinese government so people could build a, a good quality permanent house. There was, the engineering was fairly straightforward. We can design and build safe houses using locally available materials and skills and tools. And people were motivated, both the homeowners themselves who had seen their house collapse or maybe lost a family member, they were motivated to build safely. And the government, the local leadership, they were also uh, quite interested in making sure people had a safe, healthy home in the end. So it was a very collaborative process and all of the elements were there, so it was quite successful. What are some of the hurdles you have to overcome uh, in this type of work? Well, money is one of the biggest, biggest hurdles, both with both for build change and for the homeowners themselves. You know, I talked about China a little bit before and how there was adequate funding for people to build safely. And that was a key critical component to the success of those, those, those programs. Contrast to after the 2007 and 2009 earthquakes in Indonesia, where the government provided a very small grant to the homeowners to rebuild, which was really not sufficient. It wasn't, it wasn't enough to cover the complete home. And so some homeowners were able to make ends meet. They were able to put in their own money to the process. They were able to reuse some materials from their collapse building. But not all homeowners had um, the ability to do that. And so in that case, there were some homeowners that couldn't finish their home. There are other homeowners that uh, maybe couldn't follow the building standards. And so when there isn't sufficient funding available, then it's hard for people to build a disaster resistant home. And this is both after a disaster and before. Um, some of the other obstacles are corruption. Um, you know, construction is one of the most, um, well, it's one of the most opportuni opportune environments for corruption, I guess. And so using this model of um, putting the cash in the hand of the homeowners is one of the best ways to fight corruption here. So if we, if we give a conditional cash grant to a homeowner, you know, they um, have to use it for their house and they have to follow the building standard. Um, we have a very high success rate and little opportunities for corruption because the homeowners aren't going to steal from themselves, right? So we're taking um, some of the corruption elements out of the supply chain here. More than once a month, earthquakes of the magnitude of seven or greater will happen somewhere in the world. About once a year, quakes of magnitude eight and higher happen. That's what seismologists call great earthquakes.
One of the things we don't have is uh, your set of eyes. Um, and you've, I know from visiting with you yesterday that you've lived in a lot of different locations as a result of, of earthquakes, disasters, um, and you've seen a lot. Um, what are some of the stories you'd like to tell uh, that perhaps people who aren't thinking about these, I mean, we see it on the news, but it's a 24 seven cycle. You know, this horrible crisis there is replaced by another horrible crisis. Um, what are some of the things that you've seen that you think people need to know? I think a fear of earthquakes um, or a, a paralysis by fear of earthquakes because they're so unpredictable. We don't know when they're going to happen. The seismologists are pretty good at this point in letting us know, okay, there's a fault located here. It can produce this magnitude of an earthquake, but we don't know when. And so because of that uncertainty, because an earthquake can happen and an entire population or entire housing stock can be destroyed in 30 seconds with no warning. It paralyzes people with fear. And one of the messages that I, I wanna convey is that it's possible to prevent this from happening because most people die because something man-made collapses on them. And so we should be able to change that. It's a man-made problem. There should be a man-made solution or a woman-made solution. So, so it is possible to prevent this disaster from happening. We can do it, but it does take investment in strength strengthening buildings and fighting corruption and building capacity of local engineers and local workers and local and local professionals. But there's advantages to that too because when we embark on large scale um, rebuilding programs or prevention programs where we're retrofitting buildings before the next earthquake, there's a job creation component. We can put money into the pockets of low income, low skilled workers who do the work. We can um, put money back into the economy when building materials are purchased and that sort of thing. So there's a, it is possible to reduce this risk. It is possible to, safe build, to build safe buildings. We can do it affordably in a way that's culturally appropriate. Yeah, so it's, you, you talk a lot about post because you come in after the fact, but, but pre is more important, but yet buy-in isn't there. It's, it's when people see the imagery and they're like, oh, I've got to do something to help. Yes. But if they did something in advance, they wouldn't see a lot of that imagery. How do you kind of change that, flip that, I guess? Uh, it's tough, isn't it? It is tough. We spent our first 10 years responding to disasters. When we had our 10th anniversary, we decided that it's time to start preventing them. So we have two programs. We actually have four programs right now in Guatemala, Colombia, Indonesia, and the Philippines that are largely prevention programs. So working with people to retrofit houses and schools before the next earthquake and typhoon. So we have expanded our mission beyond responding. And, you know, it's regularly shared in our field that investing $1 in prevention saves $7 in reconstruction costs. So there's a clear financial argument, but yet, how do we motivate people to recognize um, and to actually take action to prevent this from happening? And so we've been making some headway, especially in, in Colombia and Guatemala, where we are working, again, very much from the bottom up as well as from the top down. And so we have to figure out what is going to motivate all of the stakeholders involved to take action here. And from the top down, we've been able to share some interesting modeling about how many people might be killed, how many dollars might be lost, how many buildings might be collapsed with senior decision makers that I think is very compelling when you actually put these numbers on the table, how many people might become homeless. And that has helped to encourage decision makers to take to take action. From the bottom up, we have to figure out what's going to motivate the homeowner to retrofit their home. After a disaster, it's easy. You know, their home has collapsed, they're living in a tent or some other temporary condition. So it's easy to motivate homeowners there. But in a place like Guatemala, Guatemala City, where we're working now, many homeowners are aware of earthquakes because Guatemala has a recent history of earthquakes. Many homeowners are already taking action to build their houses in a, in, a, in a stronger way. They just need a little bit more. And you know what else is interesting there is that many of the homeowners are still in single story buildings and they want to expand vertically. And so if we can uh, provide the knowledge and technology of, about how to do that and then some financial incentive for them to strengthen their ground floor, which means they can expand their second story, it's much more attractive to them because they get more room for their family. Maybe they have a rental unit that they can use to generate income. So there's an opportunity, especially in Central America right now, where the populations that we're dealing with are living in single and two-story buildings. Colombia on the other side, many of the areas that we're working with, the buildings are already three, four, five-story buildings. 
and very difficult to come up with an engineering solution for those buildings. We can retrofit, we can strengthen a single two or three story building, but when you get to four and five story buildings, it's really tough. It becomes expensive, it becomes difficult to do. And so there, we need policy change. We need some enforcement on the maximum number of stories. And then we also need some incentive for people not to build so high, right? And what we're one, what we're what we've recently been thinking about in Colombia. You know, I'm an engineer by training, and so we're always looking at this as an engineering problem. But I wonder if this is really an access to savings, to to a savings account problem. If people had a savings account, would they take that money that they earned and put it in a savings account instead of building the fourth floor of their house? Because I think people don't realize that how risky of an investment that is. Building a fourth floor of a masonry home in an earthquake prone area, your investment could be gone in 30 seconds. And so we are trying to look at the problem beyond just an engineering problem and looking, look at it from the, from the um, policy advocacy uh, angle as well as the access to financial services angle. One final question, when you leave these communities after being there for a period of time and seeing the change, uh, what are some of those moments like when you, when you leave? When you walk in to an area that's devastated, when you leave, you're seeing the change. What's that like? I, I, am, I can only speak English. I'm terrible at foreign languages. I've lived in all of these countries and I'm usually working with a translator. But in some cases, you don't really need a translator because you can see the expression on people's faces. And I remember in China especially seeing we interviewed people at the start and they looked stressed, they looked anxious, you know, they were worried about their home, and at the end, they're relaxed and they're happy and they're confident their, their house can keep them safe. And seeing that transition is one of the most rewarding things. Um, I remember one of the first homeowners that we worked with in Aceh in Indonesia after the tsunami. We were going through our sort of very detailed survey list of questions and she sort of just cut through it all and said, now I can sleep at night. And that's the kind of confidence that we want to bring to a family and um, enable them to feel that their house is going to keep them safe. We'll leave it there. Thanks so much. My pleasure. That's great.